Good evening. I'm Superintendent Joe Gothard, and I'm glad to be with you tonight at uh, our virtual meeting. I'm sorry for the delay we experienced. I, I hope that many of you are still here, although looking outside on a beautiful St. Paul summer night, I wouldn't blame you if you're not. Uh, for those of your friends or those of you who can't stay for the entire thing, we are recording this and we'll be sure that it's available as well. I'd like to start tonight by saying that as our leader of our school district, I'm also a parent. Uh, my son will be beginning his senior year of high school here in St. Paul Public Schools. Uh, so this decision and the work that we're doing has been weighing heavily on me as both a parent and our leader. And I'm here to tell you that I too am looking for the information that I need to make the best decisions for our school district and for our community. Uh, tonight, we are, I'm happy that we have in live stream three uh, spoken languages and our uh, American Sign Language interpreter here with us as well. Uh, very glad that we can be open and inclusive and inviting to our communities. So tonight I'm going to share with you um, our goal uh, of planning for this upcoming school year. And I have to say from the very beginning, um, our school start date is September 8th. Um, I do not have the plan for what that day will look like right now. But what I do need to share with you is our planning to date so that you know uh, the many things that we're considering as we move forward and we get closer to that September 8th date. As you know, back in June, we were given three different scenarios to plan for from the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, those three were to continue distance learning as we ended the school year. And I'll talk about a key differentiation between distance learning as we ended the school year and distance learning that we might experience as we begin this upcoming school year. The other, the other scenario was traditional learning back in our buildings um, with all students full time and maintaining healthy guidelines uh, that are given by the, the state uh, Department of Health and our, uh, the CDC. And I can share with you at this point that it is uh, likely not going to be recommended that we bring all of our students back to our schools, whether there are big high schools of 2,000 students or our elementary schools that are, that are 200 students. Um, it just isn't safe at this point. We haven't been giving clearance that we'd be able to bring our students back in that manner at this point. So the middle ground is a hybrid learning instruction where we combine online and face-to-face -face instruction and we do it in a way that we can reduce the amount of students uh, and staff in some cases that are in their sites so we can maintain uh, those guidelines that we've received to this point. And I'll go through that in more detail as I go through tonight's information. I'd also like to share that these are contingency plans. We've just completed contingency planning for the school year in those three scenarios. What we are moving into next is our transition plans. Uh, folks, I need to share with you that it is very likely uh, that we are in a variation of different plans throughout the year. Um, and that could change uh, for our entire district, it could change at schools, and it could most certainly change for individual students and individual staff, uh, depending on the impact of COVID-19. So I want to share with you some of the guiding principles uh, that we're assuming as we move through, move through our planning. First, we want to focus on the needs of our students, our staff, and our families. We want to prioritize well-being, including social, emotional, and physical health needs of all of our students and our staff. We want to champion equity in making sure that our students can make progress towards their goals and exceed their goals. Now, that is the goal of what we want to do here every day. And finally, we want to design a fiscally responsible and sustainable way that we can move forward. And there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in our community, around our state, around the country for that matter, but we wanna do it in the best way possible for our school district. Some of the other things that we need to consider in terms of our assumptions uh, as we've gone through these planning exercises is we know that there's going to be active cases of COVID-19 in St. Paul or Ramsey County at the time of school opening and throughout the 2021 school year. There will be increased absenteeism and extended abs absences due to illness or exposure to COVID-19 that we know that we'll have to deal with. We know there will be an outbreak of COVID-19 during the school year at one or more of our schools that may require at least a temporary school closure, and schools will need to quickly pivot between the delivery models that I mentioned briefly at the outset of tonight's meeting. We know that not all students at grade level will be on campus at one time. Students may receive at least part of their instruction online or via other non-seat-based means. And finally, when at school and where possible, students will limit movement between spaces to avoid cross-contamination and maintain social distancing requirements. 
So I'd like to share with you a timeline that's guiding our work as we move forward. As I mentioned, back on June 9th, we received a plan for uh, three models, uh, giving us guidelines for how we we're going to uh, plan for the upcoming school year. We have had a team called Reopen SPPS Task Force that's been up and running in some form or fashion since May. And at that time, I predicted that we would likely have the three scenarios that we um, have continually planned for at that time. So I wanted to make sure that we got an early start on putting together the right kind of structure that could deliver the right kind of recommendations and ultimately make the best decision for September 8th and then beyond. On June 19th, we received the guidelines from uh, the Department of Health and the Department of Education that spelled out some of the details uh, that we needed to continue our planning. We know that we will receive uh, on July 27th, on or before July 27th, further guidelines that may include a decision that's made by the state, um, but it could also be for local districts to make decisions based on data and science that they're reviewing in their local areas, uh, their cities, their counties, their school districts, their schools for that matter, as I shared with you earlier. And we have a team that's working on this very closely, partnering with our health departments to make sure that they're bringing us the most reliable and up-to-date uh, data that they can and making great decisions for how we can uh, maintain a safe environment if and when we are able to do so. Um, I have heard from hundreds of, of you, uh, students, staff, and families of how this has been uh, such an incredibly challenging time for you. And I don't want to speak on behalf of my own experiences or the experiences of one, two, or three. I realize uh, that this is a, a moving target, if you will, in terms of how it impacts you. And most importantly, why we're all here impacts the education of our children. Regardless of the instructional model, most staff have these, these concerns. Uh, the challenges of, of being back in our buildings uh, have been heard loud and clear. And I want to be very clear uh, that, that I think that our 6,000 staff are incredible, and each of them has an important role in, in what we're trying to achieve, our mission here in St. Paul Public Schools for our students. And your safety is, is incredibly important to me. Um, now, I know that we've had many staff who have been working remotely, some who have reported, and we are incredibly appreciative as a community uh, that we are able to support our essential workers, that we have served more than four million individual meals since March 18th. Let me repeat that. We've served more than four million individual meals to our community since March 18th. And it's impressive, it's incredible, and it's because there have been many staff who have worked day by day, long hours, and, and done incredibly hard work that's outside of their role, their typical role and responsibility to make sure that our community's health and safety and wellness was maintained, and I thank you for that. We also heard from our families that the distance learning, uh, again, uh, model, or I'm sorry, from our staff that our distance learning presented many challenges. Um, you saw one of them at the outset of this meeting as we had a technology challenge. Uh, that's all too real. Um, all too real for some of the things that you experienced during distance learning, whether their uh, systems were slowed down or you couldn't access uh, different systems. We heard about Wi-Fi speeds from our portable hotspots that we, re, um, that we were able to uh, distribute to our students. And, and just for those outages that you might experience as individual households um, due to many reasons. So uh, that was important information for us to have as we were framing and, and making these plans. We will continue, like I said, to provide those pulse surveys as we move on. Um, and that will be through September. Uh, these check-ins are really important. I cannot urge you enough to please make sure that you provide that feedback. Um, it's something that I refresh frequently to see uh, what the different trends are and what we're hearing from you are very important stakeholders. I also need to provide some reassurances. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, we're certainly awaiting getting additional information uh, from the Department of Education and, and from the Department of Health. Uh, we're working hard to make sure that those scenarios work. Some of the things that, uh, that we've heard that could really help provide you some reassurance is, what are we going to do about masks? And who is going to be required or expected or uh, given the opportunity to wear masks? And we are uh, very close to releasing guidelines and what our practices are going to be around masks. I can't I stress enough the importance of this, as uh, there have been many, uh, many cases of, of that being uh, a very important safety factor for uh, stopping the spread of COVID-19. 
So it's something that we're working on very closely right now with all of our stakeholders to make sure that we can have clear guidelines uh, for moving forward. And I should also mention about masking, uh, especially when it involves students, and you can think about four-year-old students to 18-year-old students and, and even above. Um, I do not want this to become one more thing uh, that is a compliance thing or about discipline. This is about education, it's about health, it's about well-being, it's about the safety of others. And we are obligated, I am compelled to make sure that we are working together um, as a community to make sure that we are going to follow our guidelines, but we're going to do it in the most humanitarian way possible and, and making sure that we're not at all creating another barrier to access or another barrier to the educational values of what we're going to put out in our eventual guidelines. We also have been working on uh, passive and active screening protocols and what we might be able to do in terms of the, the different factors of, of illness and either uh, individuals acknowledging that they're not feeling well and what the steps might be. And, and also if we have to, uh, being in a situation where we are doing more active screenings in a way um, on a daily basis. So we have to work again on, on those guidelines. And again, those are guidelines that might shift based on uh, some of the factors that, that we are uh, reviewing as well, that we're uh, dealing with as well in terms of the feedback that we're getting from our schools, from our community, certainly guidelines from the health department and, and many others. Some of the safety planning that I'd like to, to go into a little bit of detail on, um, and, and I should mention as well, we're going to be giving uh, a presentation to the Board of Education next Tuesday night, and we will have uh, sponsors from each of our eight different task force groups uh, that have been part of that uh, work uh, since May, and they'll be giving a, a, a detailed update to our Board of Education. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for some conversation back and forth, and certainly questions that will go into more detail than I am tonight. Uh, we'll be sharing that information as well, uh, both before once we post uh, that presentation and, and thereafter as well. But I wanted to share with you that we are um, developing and, and extending our employee workplace manual as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, we're going to have family guidelines and expectations uh, that are COVID-19 specific. We're going to have an updated system for, for self-reporting COVID-19 in, in all of our sites. Our administrators are going to be point people for COVID concerns in conjunction with school health staff. Uh, the communication around this is going to be uh, incredibly important um, as we work to get back together in, in our schools and in our buildings. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to have guidance around masking, cloth face coverings. Uh, the health screening that I mentioned, again, we're continuing to learn more in operating in what we want to be best practices. And again, practices that we can sustain as well. And signage, we want to make sure that we can have masking, social distancing, floor markings, health screening, hand washing, COVID-19 symptoms are all going to be part, an important part of us moving forward together as well. In terms of some of the other things that we've heard, um, some of the facilities and uh, concerns that, that people have had, let me just go through some of the work that we've done there. And again, you can find more information about this and we will continually update this on our website as well. Uh, ventilation system readiness. Uh, we're working in our mechanical systems. We'll run uh, longer every day and draw in more fresh air. And we've also been able to enhance filtration during this time. Um, as our buildings haven't been occupied, uh, we have been able to really address some of the maintenance uh, standards that are both best uh, called for during COVID-19, but also just to update and make sure that, that each building is, uh, is up to a standard that we would uh, consider uh, to be applicable during our, our regular day-to-day -day operations. Our space readiness, uh, capacity analysis of all of our rooms throughout our 60 plus buildings, cafeteria and kitchen layouts for safe service and social distancing uh, during those important meal times, acrylic dividers at public receptions. Uh, if some of you have been out into some of our public uh, places, stores, restaurants, uh, checkout lines, things of that nature, um, you know, you've seen some of the different sneeze guards or, or portable partitions that they've put in place. Um, social distancing and directional signages was mentioned. We'll make sure that there's two hydration stations uh, per building uh, so that we can try to minimize the amount of time students are going back and forth and also providing students water bottles so we don't have to have uh, lines uh, of any kind at those uh, hydration stations that we can moderate that uh, much better. Uh, we're also going to have to create COVID isolation rooms for uh, that case if a, if a child or staff does show some symptoms. What is a safe way that we can assess uh, without um, um, 
being fearful of additional spread uh, in that time. Some of the cleaning and disinfection, uh, cleaning plants, new equipment for high volume disinfection, uh, rapid response teams for large scale support. Um, if there is a building or a section that uh, we believe has uh, had an infection or an outbreak, um, and we'll need additional staff to sustain. Um, this is, uh, and I, I shared this very openly with our groups back in March, that um, this is a, a, an incredible workforce issue. And I've been engaged with our, our local districts here, our neighboring districts, our metro-wide districts, our state districts, and our national districts. And, and all of us, in every one of those conversations, the what are we going to do if staff get sick or are not able to uh, report to our buildings, um, and continue to, to, to teach and continue to serve um, our students in, in that capacity. You know, what are the substitute fill rates going to be when they're already uh, really challenged and stressed on, a, on, a, on the best day? Um, so it's definitely a concern, concern that we have and something that we absolutely have to factor into our plans. Some of the personal protective equipment, uh, PPE, you might hear that referred to. We want to make sure that every employee has three cloth face coverings. Uh, paper masks for all visitors uh, that can supplement, gloves, shield and, shields, and gowns uh, for those appropriate circumstances. And we want to make sure that we're working with our Office of Specialized Services and Human Resources for any specific PPE needs. And finally, supplies. We want to make sure there's hand sanitizer in every classroom, disinfectant spray and wipes in every classroom, and as I mentioned, water bottles uh, for all of our students. So we also mentioned, or I also mentioned, um, the hybrid schedule and distance learning being a, a big part of this. And um, if you, if you want to take away, you know, a couple takeaways from tonight, um, I am standing here before you tonight saying that distance learning is going to be part of our future September 8th and uh, for the unforeseen future. Um, and I'll share with you uh, the reasons why that's going to be the case with, with our schedules and what we're planning. But I also want to make a key differentiation um, distance learning as we knew it in March, April, May, and June is gone. Um, that's behind us. We learned an awful lot. On April 6th, I believe was the day after our spring break that we began distance learning. Um, we learned an awful lot. Um, our, our teachers, our staff, our support staff, our parents uh, learned a lot about our technology, um, our platforms, our applications, and uh, we learned um, how to make, how to improve upon uh, distance learning as we were doing it, which is really difficult. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that this summer we were able to come together as a district. Uh, we were able to provide support. Um, not that we didn't provide support in the, in the spring, but we wanted to be able to provide uh, much deeper support and create what I've called distance learning 2.0. It's our next version. It's our upgraded version. It's a different version. It's a better version of distance learning as we knew it in the spring. So I want to say uh, to that end that our students and families deserve a consistent and organized school experience from pre-K to 12th grade, ABE, uh, whatever our configuration is in SPPS. That is a constant belief that I hold. We want to make sure that distance learning 2.0 is ready in all three scenarios, uh, meaning that we can toggle to distance learning 2.0 at any point based on any of the factors and more that I've mentioned tonight. Distance Learning 2.0 means that teachers will have grade level lessons and assignments in Schoology and Seesaw for each day. Lessons will be designed in a similar way to create consistent experiences at individual schools and across the district. This method of planning will lead us to be ready for quarantine periods for individual cases and classes and schools due to health concerns about COVID-19. So again, we want to be able to not just do distance learning as a as a place to go if, if we need to. We want to be ready to do it in the best way possible. We also know that uh, the health concerns that have been expressed to me, uh, that a good number of our workforce may not be able to come back to their traditional role. And as I mentioned, the concerns and the health concerns that I hold for our staff are really important. We want to make sure to the best of our abilities that we are able to accommodate if that's the case. So again, pointing out to the importance of distance learning 2.0 uh, that we make sure that it is a universal belief in our district that we're going to do it differently, we're going to do it better, and we're going to continue to grow in our delivery of distance learning. So some of the specific teacher training, 100% of our teachers will be offered professional development on distance learning 2.0 before school starts. Teachers will be compensated at the contractual rate for this professional development. 
100% of teachers will have distance learning 2.0 professional development during opening week before the start of school as well. And we'll work on those schedules as a district. As you know, uh, we try to afford as much building-based and individual-based time as possible, but we want it to be relevant, we want it to be helpful, and uh, we definitely want to gear it towards how we're gonna support our teachers to be the very best in the state of Minnesota at delivering distance learning. Students will be taught how to navigate the courses and what is expected of them, how much synchronous time or same time learning versus asynchronous or any time learning will occur. So we'll have schedules about how that will work, whether that's uh, full-time distance learning or the hybrid schedule that I mentioned. Uh, students will also be taught what the grading expectations are for each course. And we need to make sure that we're taking great care of having clear communication about what those expectations are. Speaking of grading, grades will be recorded and reported based on achievement. And parents will be notified if students are falling behind and each school will have a team to address issues with engagement and attendance. You know, I talked about the importance during distance learning of connection, of accessing, of engagement, of supporting. And those still remain four areas that I wanna do a better job at. I wanna make sure that our students, our staff, our families can access the information. I wanna make sure that there's ample connection there, connection both to obviously uh, the internet and, and making sure you can get information that way, but also some social connection so that there can be currency of information and support. Engagement, we want our assignments, we want our work to be highly engaging for our students. Uh, we want it to be area, areas that interest them, uh, that continue to keep them motivated and working towards uh, learning outcomes and goals. And then finally, supporting, an area that we have a lot of room to improve. Um, and I can't tell you enough, and I, and I thank our community, and I thank many of you, uh, our retired teachers who reached out to me and said, Joe, we just want to help. And I didn't have an answer for that. Um, I didn't have a way in distance learning and certainly in a face-to-face -face, um, arrangement in the spring uh, for, to have an answer to those individuals that, that reached out. Well, that's changed now, and we are working uh, with our community, with our community partners, to find what are going to be the reliable ways that we can provide support to families and to students during distance learning. And I will say that uh, I want to be able to do this both in a virtual way, in a distance learning way, support, but also do it in a face-to-face -face, uh, following guidelines in some of our larger spaces, schools, rec centers, and, and places like that. So please uh, be ready for more information on that. One other thing I'd like to mention in terms of that kind of support, you know, that's the, that, uh, the fourth uh, thing that I mentioned with that is that we often talk about child care and how are we going to help families in the face of doing distance learning and going back to work, um, which I understand is, uh, is going to be and uh, already is an incredible challenge. And I thank you, uh, parents, caretakers, grandparents, um, aunties, uncles, neighbors who have all pitched in to make this work in these unprecedented times. But I also want to clearly state that during distance learning, I want to talk about child care being before and after school still in terms of what services can either we provide or someone else provide. During the day, during the school hours, I wanna look at it as distance learning support if we are online and what does that look like? Um, so that means that uh, families that might um, either have to be juggling work or could have multiple children and multiple grades at home or just people who need help are able to get that kind of help. And if not from the teacher on record, it's from some of the partners that I mentioned. It's from some of the uh, different uh, communities that we're able to put together in a virtual way or again in some cases do it in a face-to-face -face fashion following those safety guidelines. So there'll be more to come on that. We have groups working on what distance learning support could look like for our future. I would like to share with you the hybrid schedule and I'm, I apologize if that has been up uh, but I haven't referred to it directly but at this time I want to refer to the hybrid schedule that has the, uh, the colored circles on it. Uh, just to give you an idea for what it means, we are looking to reduce on any face-to-face -face environment in a hybrid schedule, uh, making sure that we have 50% or fewer uh, normal capacity in that school site. And again, that continues to follow the guidelines. Uh, it's based on uh, the ratios uh, in terms of the space that we have available and other safety factors. But what this could look like is that uh, Group 1 on Monday and Tuesday would be at their school uh, on site for their regular schedule, and group two would be in school on Wednesday and Thursday. Okay, so on, on Wednesday and Thursday, group one would be in distance learning, you know, again, not at school, not in their, not in their home school, 
And on Monday and Tuesday, group two would be in distance learning. On Friday, both groups would be distance learning. Um, so there would be uh, time for teachers to uh, support students, to have office hours, to plan. Um, you know, again, doing distance learning 2.0 uh, in me stating that I have high expectations for this, I have to give our staff time to do their very best as well. Uh, so it's incredibly important uh, for, for them to have that time. And I should also mention that we are still under review for that Friday being the day, the distance learning day, or the, uh, the both groups distance learning day. The other recommendation is a Wednesday. Um, again, I wanna work with you, I wanna work with our staff, I wanna work with what makes the best sense for us in moving forward as we do that. Early childhood and half day pre-K will follow the same group schedule during their normal class time, a.m. or p.m. It's important for me to, to mention that. Again, the hybrid schedule um, has some limitations. There's a lot of moving parts. Some of you might be wondering about transportation. How are we going to get students to and from when we're already having to reduce the amount of students that we have on our buses? So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we are gonna have to exercise incredible patience. Uh, we are gonna have to exercise um, great judgment and thought and, and truly embody a collaborative spirit. There is no way that anything I've mentioned tonight uh, can be done by one leader saying this is what we're going to do, a board of education telling a superintendent this is what we want, a community saying to a leader or to anyone for that matter this is what we expect. Um, this is going to have to be an exercise of us moving into spaces where we can work together at accomplishing our goals and doing it by the way in a, safety, in a safe way. Um, it's the way schools should operate anyway in us coming together, but now we've got COVID-19 uh, as a serious health barrier, obviously, for us to have to navigate around. Uh, so we need each other uh, more than ever uh, in this time as we move forward, and I know I can count on this community, this staff, our students, to rise to this occasion. Some of the other um, nuances about the hybrid schedule that I just think it's important to, to quickly mention is again, the smaller class sizes. Uh, we have had some districts that I've interacted with that have been doing some face-to-face -face summer school um, and it's been great to hear from them uh, what some of the things they've encountered. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm on regular calls with, with superintendents from large districts around the country and have learned a lot about what they're seeing in their communities as well. Some of them have come back as well uh, in a face-to-face -face fashion. Of course, greatly reducing the number of students that are served um, in summer school and, and in those classrooms. You can imagine in some of our larger, even medium-sized buildings, uh, that if we're limiting uh, students, eight, 10, 12, you know, 15, the kind of scheduling and the kind of movement that is going to take place for us to achieve that. So the hybrid schedule comes um, in, in, a, in a way that we can do it, we can achieve it, but there are a whole lot of moving parts, as you can imagine. And if I could uh, comment on one word that it's going to take for us to pull off a hybrid schedule, it is communication, communication, communication. We are gonna to have to work together uh, to make sure that we can do this. And I should also mention, I said at the very beginning that these are contingent plans that we've been working on, but we're moving now into a transition. So how are we gonna transition these plans? And again, transition could be, we start uh, with one scenario and move completely into another at every, any given time, and that could be perhaps in all of St. Paul Public Schools, it could be at three schools, it could be the entire state, it could be the entire country, I don't know, but I just wanna to illustrate to you the different scales and granularities uh, that we're looking at as we make these decisions. Um, the transitional aspect of that, again, communication will be important. As you know, in a district our size that relies so heavily on, on transportation, on meal service, on specialized staff that are serving unique needs of students at particular schools. Any changes in, in that that are going to be drastic, and especially if we're already in a hybrid schedule and then go to a distant all distance learning or vice versa, uh, you know that there's going to be uh, many challenges as we go through those transitions. Uh, but you can count on us, you can count on the district uh, to provide you readily available information and, and to make sure that we're communicating uh, to the best of our abilities. I also wanna share with you tonight that distance learning by choice is something that we are required to offer from the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, families, you've written me, uh, many of you have written me passionately uh, saying that uh, superintendent is just not possible for my child to come back. And to this point, I haven't had a great response back to you. 
I wanted to make sure uh, that before tonight's meeting that we were able to address this and work together on our planning team so that I could share some information with you. So I wanna share with you that regardless of any scenario that's determined by the Minnesota Department of Education or by St. Paul Public Schools, we will be offering distance learning support throughout the school year. Um, so the entire school year 2021, if it is determined uh, that the accommodation you need for your child to thrive in St. Paul Public Schools, and for that matter, uh, to be safe in St. Paul Public Schools, that we are gonna offer um, distance learning. Uh, if, if a hybrid schedule is, is still offered and is not going to work, we wanna know about that and we will make sure that we can provide a 100% distance learning 2.0 um, experience for your child or your children. Uh, so I wanna make sure that you heard that from me tonight. Uh, the distance learning school will still maintain a student's path to graduation and will address state standards as well. Uh, we don't want this to be a substandard education. We want this to be, again, an experience that allows our students to all make progress towards their goals. And again, we want you to be able to look for more information in the coming weeks in terms of what our plans are for, um, for distance learning 2.0, if that's, that's your choice. Uh, so we've got you know seven weeks or so before September 8th. A lot could change before that time. Um, you know that I await, like many of you, uh, decisions that are made on or before uh, July 27th. Um, I know I can speak on behalf of many of my colleagues around the state. Um, and I should mention to you as well, uh, in, in talking with them, each of us are trying to apply uh, different ways of doing this, innovative ways of doing this in our districts. It's been remarkable uh, to hear the great ideas, how, how staff and, and districts and leaders are coming together uh, to make sure that, that we can do this. Um, and I'm really appreciative of their efforts. I wanted you to hear that tonight. Another group that I'm incredibly proud of is our SPPS Reopen Task Force. Um, this is a group, again, uh, that I began talking about as, as early as May. My team will tell you probably even before that, uh, knowing what typically happens in the summer and how fast it goes before the next thing you know, we have students coming into our, uh, into our buildings or expecting us to be able to provide programming. So I wanted to make sure that as a leader, I could provide them the, the structure and the support to achieve, achieve great planning. Um, and they have done such a remarkable job. Um, and there are so many different stakeholders who have informed that, including those of you who participated in our surveys. Uh, but these have been incredible groups. I, I just can't thank them enough for the work they're doing. And their work isn't over. Uh, they continue to meet, uh, they continue to challenge me, and we continue to, to take in additional feedback that we've gained from all of our stakeholders. As I mentioned, on Tuesday, July 21st, I'll be bringing an updated report uh, to our Board of Education where we'll go into some more of the details about eight different areas uh, that can be found in our, in our task force, the work groups that have been assembled. And we'll make sure that we hear uh, some of the questions, concerns, feedback that, that our board members have as well. Um, I mentioned please, uh, please, please, please take those surveys as they come to you. Um, our team promises to make them short and sweet. Uh, where possible, but with very meaningful information. Um, and I do know that some of you reached out to us uh, with some of the wording and things like that. We're always open to that feedback and really appreciate you doing that as well, so thank you. I'll also schedule additional meetings. Um, I thought it was important as I've tried to establish a somewhat regular cadence with you in coming forward and having uh, some of these meetings and making sure that I could meet face-to-face -face with you. I know that there have been times where I've I uh, had questions come in and perhaps in the future they will be more interactive. Tonight I wanted to share with you our planning to date. Uh, I wanted to share with you uh, what we're thinking about September 8th and how we're awaiting the information to move, move our contingent plans and the transition plans uh, once we get uh, the official guidance. Um, I can't say to you enough how um, incredibly challenging these times have been when thinking about 37,000 students, um, 6,000 staff, tens of thousands of parents, caretakers, uh, family members who, who love the members of their family who are students in our school district, and not to mention a great St. Paul community as well who does truly support our education. Um, I mentioned throughout this meeting the incredible work we have ahead of us. Um, I believe in our district. I believe in our ability to come together and facing many challenges do more than the best that we can, and that is put the education of our children first and foremost, along with safety and health, making sure that I can support our staff to be the very best version of themselves each and every day, and the health concerns that they've shared with me are very real to me, and I wanna make sure that I can address those as well. 
and in doing so uh, within the framework that I've shared with you tonight. Now, there's a lot of additional details uh, that still need to be discussed, decided, shared with you, uh, but that is our goal, that is our task, that is what we're working for, for St. Paul Public Schools for the 2021 20, school year. So again, on behalf of our Board of Education, on behalf of our amazing staff, our students, our families, I wanna thank you for joining uh, me tonight and uh, wish, that you, wish you to stay safe and I'll be back with you very shortly uh, to introduce new or additional information. Thank you, everybody.